La conferencia final está a cargo de don James Doig, eh, quien es subdirector del Archivo Nacional de Australia. Y aquí tenemos a los compañeros adelante para el saludo y el inicio. Los saludo, don Alexander, primero. ¿De aquí o de allá? Mr. James, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you okay. Good. Well, first of all, uh, thank you a lot, your time, your effort. I know it's really early right now in Australia, but we really appreciate you taking your time to do this presentation for us. Uh, it's really important that we have this opportunity to learn of what's happening uh, in other places, uh, way outside of our continent. And uh, we have been walking through different topics these three days regarding digital archives, regarding national policies in the development of archives. And we wanted to finish our presentations uh, by understanding the essence of what, what it means to be an archivist in the middle of a digital transformation process in a national archive, in an archives in our different institutions, and in a country in the middle of, a, of economical society development in the world. So uh, this is why we wanted your presentation. We are really grateful for you to take your time to be with us. And the, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Mm. Well, thanks, Alexand. Uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to be here virtually, so to speak. Um, I wish I was there in person. I just checked the weather in San Jose and it's uh, 23 degrees over there, a little bit stormy. Um, but right now here in Canberra, it's uh, 7 o'clock in the morning and it's minus 3 degrees Celsius. And I can look outside here and there's a layer of white frost over the ground. So would be nice to be in a warmer climate at the moment. Um, just to introduce myself, as Alexander said, my name is James Doig. Um, I've worked at the National Archives of Australia for 19 years now. I started there in 2001. Um, my background is as a historian. I've got a PhD in medieval history from um, University of Swansea in Wales in the UK. But um, since I've worked at the National Archives of Australia, I've mainly worked in digital records. So I was quite closely involved in the development of the, the software, the digital preservation software we currently use there. Um, and also at different times, I've worked in, uh, in developing archival skills at the National Archives. So I've done over the years a whole range of different work there, but but I see myself as an archivist, and that's that's my role there. Um, look, I'll switch now to the presentation. Uh, I'll just share the screen. Hopefully, this will work. If you hold on a sec. Uh, can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's, a, it's a really good time for me to do this talk at the moment because the National Archives of Australia is leading a digital transformation push across the Australian government. Um, and we're also undertaking an internal digital transformation program in difficult fiscal circumstances. And all this as we try to position ourselves as an exemplar agency for other uh, government agencies. Um, so what I intend to do today is to discuss the work of digital transformation in the context of where the NAA, I'll call the National Archive the NAA in this talk. So where we've come from, 
where it's placed today and where we're going. And in that way, I hope to give you some idea about what's worked for us, what hasn't worked for us, and a vision for the role of the NAA in the future. Um, it is important to take a step back sometimes and see the forces that have shaped what we do and how we do it. And that way we get a much clearer idea about the role of the archivist of digital transformation. So this is what I intend to do today. I'll give you an overview of the NAA. I'll provide, um, uh, I'll give you an idea of the functions and role of the NAA, the challenges that we're facing, the current projects that we're doing, and uh, future directions. So, by way of background, the National Archives of Australia is an executive agency of the Australian Government, and it was established under the Archives Act in 1983. So, in that sense, we're a relatively young National Archive. So, by way of comparison, the French National Archive was established by law in 1790. Um, in the United Kingdom, Public Records Office as it was called then, was established under legislation in 1838, and it only got a purpose-built building in, I think, 1856. Um, in the United States, the National Archives and Records Administration was established in 1834, and it was not until 1950 that NARA required the Federal Records Act. Um, Canada set up its public archive in 1872, and it acquired legislation in 1912. So the National Archives of Australia is younger than any of those institutions. And I think that's a good thing because it actually means we're more flexible and we're more tied to traditional approaches to doing things. We're more inclined to try out new things. Um, to give you some idea of our history, what that slide up there is talking about, we're established originally in 1944 as a small unit of just one person within the National Library of Australia. And it grew through the 1940s and 50s to be a division within the National Library. And its aim then was to improve uh, the efficiency of the executive arm of government by, amongst other things, providing training to records managers in government departments. But it wasn't until um, 1961 uh, that the Archives Division got its independence from the National Library and became what was called in the, the Commonwealth Archives Office. And it took many more years for us to gain our foundation legislation. So the Archives Bill was introduced to the Australian Parliament in 1978. And it did not become law until 1983. Um, I'll talk a bit more about the Archives Act later because it gives us quite strong powers. Um, but before then, you know, I'll talk a bit about our organisation and our collection. So there's a map of Australia and you can see the, all the capital cities are there in red. I'm there in uh, yellow in Canberra, which is the capital of Australia. And so, I mean, as you know, Australia is a big country and we have an office in every state and territory. Uh, our head office is in Canberra, where I'm speaking from. And we have overall custody of 356 kilometres of physical records. And these are held in repositories around the country. So the largest proportion of holding is in New South Wales. So I've got 134 kilometres of records there, which is 37% of the collection. Um, in the Australian Capital Territory, so here in Canberra, uh, we've got 116 kilometres in a, a new purpose-built building that we only moved into a couple of years ago. So that's 33% of the collection. And the other parts of the collection are just spread generally, um, you know, across the other repositories. Uh, the smallest there is Tasmania, down the southern island there, 1.5 kilometres. Um, on physical records, um, by far the highest proportion 
as you would expect, to paper files and documents. So that accounts for 77% of the physical collection. But we hold many other record types, maps and plans, bound volumes, audiovisual records on, you know, on, on physical media, index cards, photographs, and so on. Of course, increasingly, we have large digital collections and this is probably where it gets quite interesting. So we have three primary digital collections. And these are the digital archive. Um, and this is the archive in Canberra. And this collection contains primarily documents, text-based digital records transferred from government, government agencies or deposited by personal records donors, sort of former prime ministers or members of parliament and so on. And this collection comprises, at the moment, about 10 million digital files, which is about 10 terabytes. So it's not that large. Um, you can see on the screen there, um, 6 million of those are actually the original sort of bit stream that we get in. We go through a process of, um, of sort of analyzing formats, any formats we think are at risk we will also create a normalized copy, which is a preservation copy, a, a sort of open preservation format. And we've got over 4 million of those. So we don't necessarily normalize every digital record that we get. Um, we also have a big audio visual archive, and that's that MXF you see there. Um, and MXS stands for MediaFlex. Uh, and this, can, which is a commercial off-the-shelf system, this collection contains digital audio-visual formats transferred from government agencies and also digitised copies of audio-visual formats produced for preservation and access. And that collection comprises about half a million digital files, and that's large, uh, that's, over, that's about 1.2 terabytes and growing all the time because obviously AV files are very large. We also have a large collection of digitised files of digitised images of physical records, mainly paper records. And we've got 120 million individual digitised files, mainly JPEGs, and that can, that's about 75 terabytes. Um, this slot doesn't show everything. We've also got a lot of high-resolution TIFF images that we're currently storing on hard drives. Uh, they're ready to be processed into our digital archive. Um, we'll talk a bit more about that later. Of course, the projected growth uh, is huge. You know, by 2026, 27, we expect our digital collection to have grown to about 25 petabytes. Um, in total, collection comprises about 40 million items, both physical and digital. That's a lot of records to manage. Um, of that 40 million, only about 15 million are described on our catalogue. So that means that most of our collections are actually not discoverable by the public at item level. We've really got to think of new innovative ways to describe more records and make them publicly available. Um, now, as for archival management systems, you know, these are the systems we use to control those records. Um, our main archival management system is called Record Search. Um, that's an in house built system that comprises a number of modules that carry out archive functions and workflows. Um, the main modules of record search were introduced between 1997 and 2004. Um, and our delivery or access system is called Search and Retrieve. And it's one of the modules of record search and is our public catalogue. And that, that's the platform on which digitised records are displayed and downloaded. So that's quite an old system, you know, and we, it really needs a good refresh. Our other main systems, as I mentioned, are MediaFlex, a commercial off-the-shelf asset management system, 
be acquired in 2014. Um, and that's physical and digital uh, management of, of audio visual record. We customise to meet our requirements. And the digital preservation system is an in-house built software platform that went into production in 2007. And that ingests, manages and preserves those non-audio visual digital records like emails for stock data sets and so on. Um, one last point to make about how we manage records is, um, is our archival control system or descriptive system that we use to control the collection. And that's called the Australian Series System. And that was developed by National Archives staff in the 1960s and 70s, mainly by an archivist named Peter Scott. Uh, it's a system that's used across Australia and New Zealand archives, and it's also used in some overseas jurisdictions. Um, it's an extremely flexible system that separates provenance information from record context, and thereby it's able to track document changes in the control and ownership of records by government agencies over time. This is important to us because in Australia, um, government functions and the records that document those functions move around from government agency to government agencies quite a lot. And that's a process that's called administrative change. And we need to document that change. Um, I mentioned earlier that the Archives Act, which is our foundation legislation which clearly sets out our functions. And um, the Archives Act gives us very strong powers concerning record keeping practices in government agencies. So, in particular, the Archives Act is quite strong on the disposal of records and transfer to the, to the archives. So, only the archives can authorise the disposal and destruction of common records. And we do this through legal instruments called records authorities. Um, also, the introduced penalties if government agencies destroy or alter records without our consent. Um, so, back in 90, um, 1983, under the Archives Act, when records were 25 years old, they were transferred to us as soon as possible and less destruction has been agreed. But that 25 years has now been reduced to 15 years. Um, and also the, over, the archives has overall responsibility for determining which material is of permanent archival value and therefore should be transferred into our custody. Um, the Archives Act also has a very broad definition of record. So basically it's anything in any format that contains information. And the Act confirmed the National Archives as the main advisor to agencies keeping, evaluating and disposing of records. So we are basically the standard setter for government agencies. So a big role in how agencies do their record keeping and information management. Um, but you might be asking yourself, what's, what's all this got to do with digital transformation? And it's actually quite fundamental. Um, the Archives Act gives us strong powers to take a lead role in digital transformation across Australian government. And why is this important for archivists, for us? Um, one reason is the quality of government record keeping and information management has profound downstream effects on the archives. If government agencies are creating records in a consistent way, in systems interoperable, interoperable and designed according to recognised standards and best practice, the archives should receive archival value records that are well described, complete and authentic. Poor record keeping and information management creates a huge legacy burden 
full archives to impose control over records. And I can tell you, working in digital records, there are horror stories I can tell you about big transfers of digital records from government agencies that are big, utter heaps that we just have to sort out and manage. It's a, it takes a lot of resources and time to, to deal with that. So the National Archive has been in business of transforming information management in government for a long time. Um, if we go back almost a quarter of a century, in December 1995, Australia became the first country in the world to develop a standard on records management. And this is Australian standard 4390. Um, following the approval and release of the Australian standard, the international records management community began work on the development of an international standard using 4390 as its starting point. And that was published at uh, ISO 15489, um, the big ISO international standard. And that standard represents recognised international best practice guidance on record management. Um, in the late 1990s, the National Archives also played a lead role in the development of a metadata standard called the Australian Government Locator Service. Or AGLS, and that specifies 19 core metadata elements for resource discovery within a networked environment, um, in particular, of course, the World Wide Web. Um, and all government departments um, have, and, and all governments, including state governments across Australia, have adopted AGLS as their standard for describing web resources. Um, at the same time, in the late 1990s, the National Archives embarked on an ambitious research and development program that included a digital transformation program internal to the archives. Um, and it began with a, a world first National Archival Institution Training Initiative. So in 1998, the National Archive placed all archival staff in the government services branch in a year-long professional development program on contemporary record keeping. And these were a set of tertiary units, so university units on dig digital records and record keeping, which is provided by Monash University in Melbourne. Um, and services offered to agencies was actually scaled back at that time, while professional archivists in the branch juggled the role uh, of practitioner and student. Um, and this period of professional development also marked the beginning of a new round of product development for government agencies. So the culmination of that activity was the release in March 2000 of the e-permanent suite of products. I'll go for oh, it's not right. Yeah, it's mentioned here a bit. Um, so, impermanence delivered a reinvigorated message to government agencies on the importance of record keeping and good government, backed up by a comprehensive suite of advisory products that agencies could use to build best practice record keeping environments. And the um, cornerstone of e-permanence was the DIRCS manual. Now, DIRCS stands for Signing and Implementing Record Keeping Systems, and it built on ISO 15489 to provide comprehensive practical guidance on designing and implementing record keeping systems via an eight-step methodology. Um, the manual also contained information about a range of related activities, such as how to build a business case for record-keeping system development projects. So this was for agencies to develop business cases uh, to convince their organisation that they need money to, you know, to, to build a record-keeping system. And it was supported with a, a trading course. And that Dirk's methodology gave rise to a number of practical 
tools that underpin good record keeping. So it provided the essential framework to establish a business case for record keeping, develop a business classification scheme that identifies and defines the unique function and activities of an organisation, construct agency specific classifications tools such as a function thesaurus, compile a functions based records disposal authority for the disposal of records, compile a general disposal authority for records relating to common administrative functions, and to adopt appropriate metadata standards for the control and retrieval of records, and also to design and select record management software products and other electronic business information system that meet the agency's requirements to manage records. Uh, now, a key component of the metadata standards, of, of a permanence, the record keeping metadata standard. Um, now, that's a critical tool to describe information about records and the context in which they're captured and used in Australian government agencies. That's critical because the key thing about our work as archivists, especially in Australia, is that we reuse agency record keeping metadata for archive purposes. So that's a key thing to remember how, manage, how agencies manage their records, as I said before, affects how we manage records and the resources we need to, to you know, to fix up. Um, what agencies give us. So the first version of the metadata standard was developed in the late 1990s, and it was designed to be used in conjunction with Dirk's manual. And the focus of it was on a single entity, uh, the record. Um, the second version of the standard was published in 2008, and it was a complete revision and extend, extended the standard to a four entity model which included record, agent, function, and mandate, and described in detail relationships between those, those four different entities. Um, the work fed into the international standard on metadata for records, which is now ISO, um, what is it? ISO 43081, which you can see there, 2006 standard which is a suite of three standards for setting out principles, implementation issues, and a self assessment checklist. Um, now, of course, these standards continue to be developed. We're now up to 2.2 of the record keeping metadata standard, which was released in 2015. Um, it's important to understand that the record keeping metadata standard is a key product because it describes in detail the metadata properties that should be captured in each entity, like record data and function and so on. And like any standard, it describes a consistent approach for government agencies to manage their records. As I mentioned previously, you know, good record keeping practice makes the work of, of archivists easier when it comes to selecting, transferring and accessioning archival value records. Um, I'll go back to that slide. Um, now, the National Archives continue to produce products for agencies in the 2000s. Actually, I think it's this one, including ideal functional specifications for record keeping systems and business systems, and contributing to standards development such as ISI 16175, the one down the bottom there records and electronic um, office environments. Um, now, however, just because the National Archives develops and publishes standards, guidelines and methodologies on record keeping and information management doesn't mean that government agencies implement them or that they even can be implemented by agencies. And this is quite important lessons learned. Um, for us over the years, that affecting digital transformation in government requires active, ongoing, whole-of-government management and monitoring. 
So in 2007, for example, a report on record keeping in the Australian public service called the MAC report found that agencies were having difficulty implementing the DIRC methodology and that consequently it was taking a long time, in some cases years, for agencies to actually develop a records authority. Um, as a result of this, the National Archives streamlined the DIRC's process and implemented quicker ways um, for agencies to develop records authorities. So we did have to respond to those issues. Um, what was more worrying was that we found as the 2000s progressed that most agencies um, still had record keeping and information management practices that were far less than better practice. And so one example of this was that we found that very few government agencies had implemented the record keeping method standard. The feedback from agencies was that they were finding it difficult to implement because it's quite a complex standard. And record keeping areas within agencies are often quite small, comprising lower, lower, start, lower level staff that weren't particularly funded. Um, so our response to this problem was to develop what we call a minimum metadata set, which is a subset of record keeping metadata standards, but which is easier to implement. So the minimum metadata uh, set nine core set nine metadata properties required for the management of business information. And we require these properties to be mandatory when agencies transfer their records to us. And this is quite a good lesson learned. Uh, we need to be able to respond effectively when agencies are telling us that they're having problems implementing our standards. If we fail to act, agency information management will not improve which not only affects their efficiency and ability to conduct business, but it will have, as I've said before, it will have downstream effects on archives. Um, another significant issue with government record keeping was it became clear that agencies weren't necessarily managing their records digitally, but they were printing them to paper. So in 2010, we estimated that the cost in terms of efficiency, um, so records that are managed digitally consistent with best practice principles and standards, are easy and quicker to find and retrieve for business purposes. Um, and printing paper was costing $220 million per year for the government to, you know, to store those paper records. So it's easier to use and reuse the data and content in ways that value if they're kept and managed in digital environments. And it's easier to make those resources available to different users through, through digital channels. So since 2011, we've, we've, the National Archives has been the lead agency in pushing whole of government digital transformation. Um, so in 2011, the, the Australian government released the digital transition policy. And this policy was developed by the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, so the Prime Minister's own department. Um, and this aims to move government agencies toward digital records management for efficiency purposes. Um, under the digital transition policy, the 200 plus agencies were expected to self-assess annually and submit the results of that assessment to the National Archives so that we could check their progress in moving to digital transformation. Uh, also, senior managers in government agencies were expected to drive change. Um, and agencies were expected to reduce their paper stockpiles. And they were also expected to transition towards fully managing their digital information in digital formats. 
uh, as I said, the National Archives had a lead role in that work. Um, we were to lead and promote the policy, uh, develop a digital continuity plan, whole of government, measure the success of agency affecting change, and report to government on the rate of transition, recommend further strategies. Um, now, the next step um, was in 2004, when the National Archives released an online software tool called CheckUp Digital, and that allowed government agencies to self-assess their digital information management capability and their digital maturity. Um, so CheckUp Digital, the tool, allowed whole-of-government benchmarking and produced individual agency reports so that we were able, again, to gauge their projects. And these reports were published online, so they were publicly available to anybody that was interested. So in 2016, the results showed that approximately 70% of government agencies had completed their transition to uh, digital information and records management environment. And this was a strong result, as in 2013, the figure was only 40%. Uh, now, the digital transition policy said that the National Archives would develop a digital continuity plan for government agencies. And this was issued in October 2015 as Digital Continuity 2020. So, DC 2020 contained three principles. One, information is valued. Two, information is managed digitally. And three, information systems and processes must be interoperable. Uh, DC 2020 also identified a number of key actions for government agencies, as well as interim pathways and targets. And these targets include agencies having an information governance framework by the 31st of December 2016, agencies having chief information governance officer, 31st of, De 31st of December 2017, and also agencies implementing a program of professional development um, of information management staff to achieve professional recognition. And in that way, agencies will develop the skills and capability of their staff. The skills and capability is key to digital transformation. Um, now, DC 2020 winds up next year, and we're now in the process of deciding what our information policy approach will be after 2020, so that we can continue to build on the program today. Um, there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, a number of recent government reports have all noted the need for improved data and information in government. Um, the importance of making big data openly available to the public using digital channels and the need to provide better digital services to the public. Um, over the years, there have been a lot of failures in government as a result of poor record keeping and poor information management practices. Um, in 2016, the government established an agency called Digital Transformation Agency, um, which is charged with improving government digital services to the public. And late last year, it released its Digital Transformation Strategy, which aims for Australia to be one of the top three digital governments by 2020. Um, whether that is achievable remains to be seen. It's pretty ambitious. Um, but the strategy has direct implications for us as the National Archives. Um, as the custodian of the most significant government data and information, and as the organisation that sets standards and provides information management policies and advice to government agencies, uh, we will have a big role, continue to have a big role in all that going forwards. Um, now, this is probably a good point to shift my focus uh, to talk about digital transformation within the National Archives. 
I have got my eye on the time here. Um, but anyway, um, so in order to progress digital modernisation across the Australian government, we've, we've had set ourselves the target to become an exemplar digital agency within government. So over time, you know, we, the National Archive must transition to become a, a digital archive by default, meaning that we move from working primarily with analogue or physical records to working primarily with digital records, either in the form of born digital records or digitised copies of, of physical source records. Um, however, this will mean, of course, that we'll continue to work with a hybrid collection of both physical and digital in the foreseeable future. Um, you know, and as I mentioned earlier, our digital collection will continue to grow with ever increasing rates. Um, so in saying that the National Archives will move to working primarily with digital, the aim is to move um, towards digital decision making and for business processes to be more fully digital. Every action taken should have digital outcome. We shouldn't produce paper as a result of decisions. Um, and of course, um, the future state is not something that we can control, but we can plan for it. You know, we do know that government agencies are creating huge amounts of records in digital formats and physical formats. Now, we had a survey in 2006, and we know of the agencies that responded, they're managing about 30 petabytes of digital records. Um, about 15 cents got to come to us as archival records. We also know that they're, they're holding at, at least uh, 15 uh, kilometres of records um, you know, in store in physical storage environments, um, or I should say, fifteen hundred kilometres of records, and about two hundred kilometres of those records we, uh, is archival and will come to us. So that prompted us to release what's called General Records Authority Thirty One, and that enables agencies to destroy certain records after digitising them to, to standards, digitisation standards redevelop. So we do expect agencies to scan their physical records to a high, you know, resolution and transfer those records to us, not the digital. So, you know, it's a huge strategic challenge. Um, you know, we know digital systems out there in agencies are highly complex digital record complex, we all know this. Digital preservation is complex because technology is constantly changing. And, and in particular, user expectations have changed. Ultimately, for a national archives, we only preserve and manage records so that the public can access them. And those public expectations have changed. They expect services to be insured transactions to be easy and for results to be immediate. They expect multiple digital channels. You know, they expect to access records via mobile, tablet, and so on. So it's an enormous challenge for national archival institutions like us. Um, not only that, we've also got concerns about our current system, systems reuse for managing digital records that I mentioned earlier. You know, some of our systems like Record Search are over 20 years old. And we do have specific concerns about those systems. There's a lack of integration between the different systems we have. As a result, end-to-end -end workflows are quite manual. And there's an increased risk of user error because system validation is not always possible. Systems are inflexible and cannot meet, can rapidly meet new business requirements. Um, there's no standard metadata schema used to define files, digital ingest or access. 
So media flex, digital archive, record search, each have different metadata requirements. But there's also system duplication. So those systems like MediaFlex, Record Search, the Digital Archive actually replicate some functionality, and that's an inefficiency. Um, access to digital records is currently limited to search and retrieve of online catalog, and that provides an incomplete view of content within the NAA. Currently, we can only make accessible um, digitized files not the born digital stuff and not the AV stuff because we don't have the, you know, the big network to deliver it. And so in essence, um, our current archiving capability um, cannot meet um, our needs. And so, you know, we need to start freshing our systems um, and infrastructure. Um, now, we've known about those issues for a long time, and we know that digital transformation requires a significant investment beyond what we can afford within the budget constraints of government, probably very similar to the situation you've got over there. Now, over time, we have put in what's called new policy proposals to government, um, which is asking government to fund initiatives. So we argue a case, we say, look, we need you to fund a new digital archive because of the deficiencies we've got. And we've tried to do this in collaboration with other institutions, like the National Library, the National Film and Sound Archive, the National Gallery. But none of those new policy proposals have actually successfully got up with cabinet in government. Um, and in some ways, that's out of our control, you know, that they might go to cabinet during, say, the global financial crisis when there are other priorities. Um, but look, we do look as well to collaborate with other institutions on innovative projects. And this is something we've found a really useful method of affecting digital transformation. So we recently collaborated with the with the UK National Archives on a blockchain project to test the application of blockchain technology to to archive digital records to prove their long-term authenticity and integrity. Um, we have been building um, with university students uh, software tools using artificial intelligence and machine learning to try and automate the appraisal and disposal process out there in, in government agencies. And, uh, and we've been sort of collaborating with other data um, institutions and agencies within government, um, looking at, at things like uh, at government functions and, um, you know, capturing those, those agency responsibilities. Um, and how they're assigned to government agencies. Uh, now, a big thing for us in affecting change, and, and I will end soon, uh, in a few minutes, is, is that in July 2018, the Director General of the National Archives, David Fricker, established a digital archive task force within the National Archives to develop and coordinate a program for digital transformation to push it at a faster rate within the archives. Um, and a number of projects sit under the umbrella of that digital archiving task force. And I'll, I'll talk you quickly through it. So there's been a couple of um, procurement projects on the way. Um, so we have procured a, a sort of enterprise grade storage, Tachi. S3 object store for the secure storage of our digital collection um, and corporate records. Um, and that procurement's important because it's established data centres in Sydney and Canberra with high speed links between. And we're also transitioning away from in house developed software like Record Search, the digital archive software. Um, so we recently went out to market to see what off the shelf 
either commercial or open source archival management and digital preservation and delivery software solutions were out there in the market. And there are quite a few. Um, and that's a large and complex procurement, and we'll get a result out, out of that within the next couple of months. Um, we've also been looking internally at our internal policies and processes and how they can be moved for more digital footing. And we've also been developing quite interesting this project as a new archival control model that builds on the Australian series system so that it's capable of representing complex record structures like you get with digital records. And we're also doing a lot of work on digital capability. How do we upskill archivists within the National Archives to become, um, to become digital archivists? Um, now, so in this talk, I'll conclude a bit now, in this talk I've tried to give an indication based on the experience of the National Archives of Australia the past 25 years of the range of digital transformation and initiatives that archivists like us can provide leadership on. And there are really good reasons why archivists should have the lead role in digital transformation. Um, in a fundamental way, more than anyone else, archivists have always needed to understand record-keeping systems and the need for good record-keeping practices by records producers. Now, as long ago as half a century ago, Peter Scott, the person who invented the Australian series system, said this about the role of the archivist. So I quote him here, the archivist concerns himself or her herself not merely with historical records, but above all, record-keeping systems. I see the archivist as custodian, analyst, restorer, preserver, and interpreter of original record-keeping systems in their historic context, and of the historical evidence and information of the contents of such systems." Unquote. So understanding the systems that agencies use to create, manage and deliver records is our bread and butter. We're not more than anybody else. And understanding and analysing those systems is fundamental to our role. We understand what good record keeping is because we've all seen the results of bad record keeping. So our leadership in digital transformation in government We'll give government information inherent qualities and characteristics that enable that information to be managed, and that will eventually come to us to manage. I think um, the role of the archivist here is absolutely essential to avoid catastrophe. And, uh, and much of this relates to the fact that archivists do see things in the long term. A rare thing in a digital environment where it's all about now, what's just around the corner. Um, the records continuum model tells us that the life of the record is never ending, and that a digital record is always in a state of coming, and that's the knowledge that archivists always bring to the table. Anyway, thank you for your time. I think I've gone over about 10 minutes. James, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Perfect. Thank you so much for your, for your presentation. I think it was really clear for all of us. And uh, it ends up confirming our suspicions that we are, as a country, walking in the right path. Uh, we have been, uh, these past three days, learning and sharing and understanding that there's a big road of uh, work ahead of us. Uh, but I, I think we are starting to uh, develop the tools that we need to walk it nicely. <laughs> so uh, once again, thank you so much for your presentation. And um, we hope that in a few years we can tell a success story from Costa Rica too. Yes, that would be terrific. Thank you. Thank you and goodbye.
Goodbye.